welcome to Hawk Talk. I'm here today with Daryl Brocker. How are you? I'm doing fantastic, brother. Love hearing it. So to kick it off, I assume you come out in the delivery room, you immediately start recruiting assets, sizing up the situation. <laughs> like from the start, you're an operator. We're ready to go. Right. That's that's just how life yeah. starts. Honestly, there is something about being the middle child. I'm the third of four. So I still consider myself the middle child yep. where you always have to build bridges and collaborate and learn from the lessons of the older, older the sibling. And then, you know, envy the younger one in the family who, you know, by the time the parents get to the fourth one, they've kind of given up yep. <laughs> in terms of tracking <laughs> everything that they do. So. Yeah, so I was born a third of four kids. Um, we were a military family. I grew up in the heel of the boot, uh, Italy, and yeah. Okinawa, Japan. So seven of my first nine years on the planet were in foreign countries, and I got that bug. You know, being abroad and smelling different smells and hearing different languages and, and seeing different cultures. It was something that was really, really important to me. And then we moved from Okinawa, Japan to Texas when I was yep. in the fourth grade. And then we okay. lived there for two years. Was that your first time going to school in the U.S.? Uh, yes, it was. So oh, fourth, and, fourth and fifth grade, San Antonio, Texas. And then my father retired from the Air Force after 20 years in 1975. I was 11 years old and moved to this very strange place that uh, had only recently integrated at schools, I think maybe two or three years by the time I got there. And growing up on military bases, you know, they had everything, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, you name it. But Georgia was decidedly <laughs> one or the other. And I always felt trapped. I always felt like uh, I, the, the, the middle, you know, the middleman type of thing. I was always comfortable in both worlds. And I was always come sometimes seen as suspect by both, both worlds. Not black enough to be hanging out with the black kids who grew up in Georgia and, and knew all mm -hmm. the, you know, the Georgia lingo and not acceptable enough in some white circles. But I was comfortable. It's it's who I am and it's in and, and it was part of of what I wanted to uh, you know to bring to the entertainment community once I, you know, once I retired. Anyway, long story short, Boy Scout, Cub Scout, ROTC in high school, ROTC at the University of Georgia, and then I become an intelligence officer analyst in the Air Force in the 1987 to 90 time frame, where I spent my first year in, in, this, in the Republic of Korea, South Korea, Osan Air Base, 87-88, and that's significant because the Seoul Olympics were being held in the summer of 88, so that entire year was probably one of the more dangerous periods of time in modern history on the Korean Peninsula. Kim Il-sung, who is the grandfather of the current, current leader, was the, you know, the recognized god of, of North Korea. He did not want the South to have a successful Olympics, so it was tense. I mean, seriously, seriously tense every day of the threat of them coming across the border, either planes or, or ships. They're already capturing and sending people down to disrupt the disrupt the Olympics. So it was a fantastic opportunity for a young second lieutenant, kind of upstart. I was always kind of, uh, let's just say that uh, self-doubt was never one of the things that I, I was plagued with. <laughs> yeah. And you can take that any way you want. But um, being confident and being sure and walking into this room where everyone at this table were all uh, either once a one-star general was like the lowest rank in the entire entire room and I'm this second lieutenant butter bar brought in and watching this spectacle and then my colonel turns to me and he says well what do you think about the briefer and I said well, I can do that and he said well good because the last three were fired and you're next up and I looked, right. at, him and I, I looked at him and I said colonel I will not be the fourth and he just kind of looked at me he maybe had known me for you know maybe a month by this point and and I didn't get fired um, what I was able to do was connect with the general. What I was able to do was collect with the whole chain of command and then stay within my lane. Don't take sides, you know, be that, you know, that, that middle of the road kind of guy. And some people see that as, oh, you're not taking a position as an intelligence officer. We're not supposed to take a position. Our job is yeah. not to tell the president what he wants to hear. Our job is to tell the president and the national security advisor and everybody else what they need to know 
for other reasons that they need to, you know, to protect, protect our nation. Yeah. So I kind of learned that my whole life, didn't realize uh -huh. I was learning it my whole life. And then so going from, you know, the, the threat of, you know, the North Korean. Uh, well, real quick, before we get there, in terms of what attracted you to the military, was it more just like my dad was in it? That's what I'm going to do. Like, what, um, where did that come from? Well, what, where that came from, it, you know, I, like I said, Boy Scout, you know, Cub Scout all the way through ROTC at the yeah. University of Georgia. Um, right. I knew I was one of the few people that in my kind of community that graduated in 1986. The job market was not good at all. But I knew I had a job. I knew that I was yeah. a commissioned officer in the Air Force, and it took uh, about six months between graduation and when my intake class for the intelligence basic course in January. So I spent the summer working at a uh, in a kosher kitchen at a at a Jewish camp in the nice. mountains of North mountains of North uh, of North Georgia, uh, Camp Barney Medins, and uh, joined the Air Force, did Korea, and then my first manhunt. And this is going to get into my 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 specialties at the agency was North Korea, Iran, and terrorism. Not recognizing that the hunt for Manuel Noriega, which is mm -hmm. my unit, was a part of part of that, was going to be my first manhunt. And then I spent 25 of my 28 years at CIA hunting down the Bin Ladens of the world, the Zawahiris of the world, mm -hmm. the ISIS and Al Shabaab, and you know I could go on and on and on. And that's that's what I did. But it's not all I did. It was probably what I'm best recognized for in terms of speaking engagements. You know, former deputy director of the Counterterrorism Center looks good, but I did yeah. everything. You have to be a utility, you know, that utility infielder. You got to be that Swiss Army knife and not just that one blade. You got to actually be able to do a number of so different things. When you went after Noriega, were you in the Air Force still? I was still in the Air Force, yes. Okay. I was, a, I was assigned to an intelligence unit at what is now Bergstrom International Airport. It was Bergstrom Air Force Base at the mm -hmm. time. And we were attached to the 82nd Airborne. We were their, their liaison to the, to the Air Force. And so when the 82nd deployed down for Operation Just Cause, uh, I believe there were probably eight, eight people from my unit. Um, mm -hmm. I was the, the second most senior. I was the first, first lieutenant at that point. And it was a captain, a first lieutenant, and I believe four staff sergeants and, and below. And it was fantastic. It was an opportunity to see a bigger picture. I think that was the first time I ever came across CIA people, not knowing that they were, at the time, that they were, uh, that they were CIA people. And I was going to ask that, do CIA ever, do they tell you they're CIA when you meet CIA people? Um, typically not. Um, it really depends on the operation, depends on the scenario. The people that we deployed with uh, as CIA were what we call tier one operators, Delta, SEALs, you know, those type of people. Of course you tell them. Of course they know because they are pretty much seconded to us and we're, you know, we're doing this together. But yeah. no, typically when you're abroad, you don't, you don't talk about CIA um, yeah. and you don't really acknowledge that there is a CIA presence. Everybody knows that there is, but it's just kind of one of those unwritten rules that you don't talk. Like the first, the first uh, rule of, of Fight Club is yeah. you know, talking about Fight Club. <laughs> I guess that's a, uh, an apt analogy for living undercover. And yeah. the difference between living undercover as a CIA and, and FBI is completely, completely different. I was always Daryl Blocker in every assignment, in every embassy. Whereas in the FBI, when you become Donnie Brasco, you literally take on this persona and become that person and live that life. You kind of do that when you're developing an asset, when you're developing a source, you become what that person needs, but you're not you know, completely undercover pretending to be someone else. Yeah. Uh, if that makes, if that makes it. It does. So in, in that situation, what are you telling the person, the asset that you're tr trying to um, get? So we're all assigned to, most people that we're targeting are also assigned to their embassies in whatever country we happen to be in. So yeah. growing up in what we call Africa division, where I spent most of my career on the African continent, well, guess what? Iranians are there, North Koreans, Chinese, Russians, terrorists, and I did all of those things. When I tell people I was spent time in Africa, they mostly think, oh, you were 
suborning, you know, African regimes. Well, no, that you're thinking 1940s, 50s, 60s, maybe the 70s. That just doesn't happen in the sense that it happens. There's subtlety that goes back and forth. You have allies and friends, but it is more of a liaison, more of a collegial relationship, particularly in the post uh, 9-11, because now it's 9-12. There's a very famous sign outside of the counterterrorism center that all it says is today is September 12th, 2001. As, and it's, um, I've been out five years, but I'm fairly confident that that sign is, is still up. And it's a reminder for people why you're there. I guess the analogy from, you know, remember Pearl Harbor, there's entire yep. generations of people, don't forget Pearl Harbor, don't forget Pearl Harbor. That's yep. our uh, modern day equivalent. Yep, that makes sense. And so you, you do this Noriega search. Did you end up joining the CIA right after that? Or were you still um, in the Earth for a while? Uh, funny, fun, that's, that's even a funnier story. So yep. I was applying at the same time. So I got the letter. So real quick, uh, just um, out there, why? What was it that you were, I mean, obviously you were doing intelligence in the Air Force, but like, right. you, that's where you didn't have like a, a family history, et cetera. What drew you to the CIA? My now ex-wife was in the Green Bay, Wisconsin airport, saw this newspaper, grabbed it and was flipping through and saw this half page above the fold ad with the big CIA logo in the middle and all these words about, you know, you want to travel the world, you want to do interesting things, meet interesting people write a 1500 word essay or less on anything that you feel uh, strongly about. And of course had to be in international affairs. Yeah. The original intifada was happening yeah. at that time. So I wrote about the history of the, 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 Palestinian, the Palestinian issue from a United Nations perspective, from a historical perspective. Someone saw that I could, you know, that I could reason and I could noodle out something. And then they responded and a series of tests. You had to go and take a lot of psychological tests. That's kind of like the first stop. And then after I took these tests is when we were ramping up for Operation Just Cause. So they called to schedule my, my polygraph and my medical. And I said, well, I'm, I'm unavailable. And they said, well, why can you, when can you, you know, when can you come? I didn't know if this campaign in Chase and Noriega was going to last a month it was going to last six months. So I couldn't yeah. really give them an answer. And I told him, I said, well, I'm, honestly, I can't tell you because it's classified. And the guy laughed and he said, yeah, we, we get that. We're in the intelligence world. But I couldn't recall whether they said, call me when you get back or we'll call you when we think you're back. I, I couldn't remember what it was. So I'm in, in Panama. I get back and there's no word from them. And I'm kind of crestfallen. I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, that this, and then I got the I got promoted to, to, uh, to captain. I was on the list for being promoted to captain. And I'm like, you know what? Let me call them. And I called them like, where were you? You've been gone for four months. We've been waiting to hear from you. And so I called them, went and took the poly, went and took medical, and then got the, the job offer. And I had to decide whether I was going to remain in the Air Force and pin on captain or if I was going to move. And at that point, four years of high school, four years of college, four years of the Air Force, my son was about to be born. It just seemed like the perfect optimal time to be moving and starting, kind of starting over. So I left the Air Force on 22 September, 1990. Okay. On 1 October, they froze everyone in the military. So I got out by eight days, eight days. If oh, I wouldn't let anyone out. If I had chosen one October as my separation date, I would have, I would probably not be at the agency and I'd probably not be having this conversation. Um, wow. So eight days difference is what so they froze. Was that, was that the Gulf War? Was that? That was doing? the Gulf War. That was the Gulf War. And I was one of the few people in my unit who knew the history of the region, who knew the history, you know, of the Arab and, and, and Muslim world. And so I was briefing all of the three stars and getting them apprised of the history and who they were and all of this kind of stuff. So they really didn't want me to go and they could have yeah. stopped me, but they also knew I was going to another intelligence community and yeah. it's a partnership. Right. So anyway, I joined the agency and I didn't know anything about the CIA other than what everybody else, everybody else knows, yeah. which 
trust me, is not very much. And yeah. so I read every negative book that I could possibly read just to kind of give me a, a sense of, can I live with this morally and ethically? And if I can, then, then, then I'll move forward. So even before I joined the agency, the, the desire to make sure that I was living up to my parents' expectations in terms of my decisions and my choices, that was it. And you know, the agency does not have the best of, uh, agency is hated by a lot of people. Agency is really, really hated by a lot of black people. And being in Los Angeles has been really strange because there are people in LA who still believe that the CIA was responsible for bringing crack to, yeah. to Los Angeles. So, and Snowfall, and I don't have any judgments on Snowfall one way or the other, but it certainly hasn't, <laughs> hasn't helped my argument that uh, we were not responsible for it. And, and I work in a community, I work in a, a group called Peace for Kids, which is a foster youth advocacy group that's been around for 25 years. And um, so for the first three years that I worked with them, I was undercover and I couldn't tell them that I was CIA. And so showed up every Saturday for months and months and months. And then eventually after three years, when I was retiring and coming out from undercover, I was going to be on ABC News as a CIA uh, contributor. And I had not told anyone at Peace for Kids that the rest of the story, so to speak. So eventually I told them, and I think if they had known at the very beginning that I was CIA, that I, they kind of, they just, they wouldn't have the same response as someone who showed up for three years and was there for them and did everything. And they knew me as a person and not as this kind of this, what is the CIA and why, why are you in the black community? Why are you trying to recruit our kids? You, you know, that type, of, that type of thought. And those questions have been asked. And the answer of course is no. We don't recruit within the United States. We don't target Americans. And you go into that and people are like, oh yeah, that's just what you say. Well, <laughs> it's not just what we say. There are laws and yeah. we, have to adhere, we have to adhere to them. Anyway, so I answered an ad in a newspaper, quite frankly. I wrote an yeah. essay, got hired in an agency. My middle name is Maurice. So I always thought that, you know, French was fantastic. So I learned how to speak French. I lived and served and worked in four Francophone countries, three in Africa and one in Europe, and recruited in, in a foreign language, which is not easy. Yeah. I mean, it's not easy to recruit somebody in, in English, much less something that's not your native. And how does that work? Like, I mean, you, you joined the CIA and like, did you just get like, okay, we need to go to recruit some people. And when you say recruit people, you're recruiting right. informants. Is that yes. basically? Yeah. Yes. We call them assets, agents, right. sources. So people make People, um, speaking in the Hollywood entertainment sense, FBI agent is an accurate description. CIA agent is an accurate description of the people we recruit, not yeah. the people who serve. We're CIA officers. We're not yeah. agents. We, we recruit agents. And yeah. so there, there's a, a long established uh, mechanism for determining what the CIA is going to be looking at, what DIA or defense intelligence agency is going to look at, what NSA is going to look at. All the members of the in intelligence community are told through this uh, national intelligence priority framework. And just don't worry about the acronym, NIPF. <laughs> but those are kind of like our, our 10 commandments. Here, yep. here are the things that you're going to look at all the time. Yep. Russia is a concern. China is a concern. Cyber is a concern. Counterintelligence is a concern. Counterproliferation is a concern. So there are probably about six or seven things that are gonna be consistently the same, whether you were back in the OSS era, you know, 42 to 45, you know, the predecessor of the CIA, or in the, um, in the modern era, and I'm talking 1945 to, you know, to the present. So let's just say I'm in Rabat, Morocco, and there's a Chinese embassy there, and I bump into a Chinese diplomat at a reception. We have similar, thoughts and beliefs outside of the diplomatic world. We might yeah. be, you know, backpackers or, you know, we just try to way to connect with someone. So ultimately you're spotting, assessing and developing a source who you think might be a viable candidate for, um, for recruitment. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the process is a process. It's like dating. It's very much like dating. 
If you're yep. married, then you have already either been recruited or you recruited someone. Yep. It literally is that simple. You would not ask someone to marry you if you're pretty sure they're going to say no. Same yep. thing with, with pitching an asset. Um, and you've already connected with that person. And it's very intimate, not intimate in a sexual sense, but intimate in the sense that that person would lose their life, would lose their job, would lose their standing, would lose so much if they were known to be um, working for the CIA. So it's yeah. intimate in that sense. So you have to protect that person. You have to protect and them you, in a way. And mm -hmm. that's, that's my, like, how do you get, let's take your example of a Chinese diplomat in Morocco that right. enjoys backpacking like you do. How does that right. go from that to, I'm going to give you secrets uh, on my country that I have access to so that I can give you information? Like, how does someone, I mean, is it that they just believe so wholeheartedly they don't agree with their own country that they want things to change or like? Yeah. There, there, that's, that could be some aspect of it. Um, you know, the, the old paradigm that they taught at the farm was what you called mice is money, um, ideology, um, coercion, and ego. Those were kind of like the four things that you were trying to look at to figure yeah. out how you're going to lure that person or how you're going to convince that person or how you're going to manipulate that person. At the end of the day, it is manipulation. Yep. But I don't necessarily see manipulation as always a negative thing. And it's innate to us. And I, I only mention this in the sense that if you have someone has a baby in their family and you see the parent you know, they see the parents and they might not have been agreeing on how to handle the child in a certain way. Even before that child is verbal, they're manipulating their parents. Everyone oh, yeah. has seen it. You've seen a little child manipulate a grown <laughs> person. It happens. It is in us. Now, do you use that manipulation for good or do you use it for, for evil? I, of course, I'm on the, I think I was yeah. doing it for good. Um, but the people that were targeting are equally convinced that their way is is the right way yeah. um and sometimes you can't argue um sometimes there are there are u.s policies that that were really hard to get behind because you knew that they weren't your moral compass they weren't your yeah. way of doing it but at the end of the day i'm a soldier mm -hmm. and not a blind soldier not someone who's just going to do it because, you know, they say, go run through that wall. I'm like, well, why am I going to run through the wall when I can just open the door and walk through? Because I told you to run through the wall. I'm like, yeah, that's just stupid. No, I'm going to open the door and walk through. You're able yeah. to think and you're able to process. And that's how, that's what they pay you for. They pay you for your judgment. They hire right. you for your, your ability to, you know, you know, there's a, for someone like myself, a case officer, there is a certain subset and set of intellectual, social, and personality traits that they're looking for, for people who can engage and, you know, elicit information or convince someone to, to do something that's not in their own best interest, but might be in yep. the interest of the greater good. So the answer to that question is, you would spend as much backpacking time with that person, you would learn about that person, you mm -hmm. would figure out whether they are a hard line, they're never, ever going to change, or if they're like, hmm, like me. That policy right there doesn't make any sense to me either. And then you just start talking about that one thing. And then eventually yeah. you can get them talking about a lot of things. And because they trust you, because that is a very real uh, friendship that's going on between you, eventually you're either going to pop the question or you're going to move on because you found a better, you know, a better source or a better avenue of getting Yeah. It. And I was going to say, before you actually say, would you like to be an agent, you know, that kind of thing. Right. For you, a lot of times, they don't even know that they're giving you information. Like you're just asking oh, questions. Oh, no. no, typically not, especially really? at the beginning, especially yeah. at the beginning where you're just talking about, so you're all diplomats. And guess what? You're talking yeah. about what's going on economically in the country or what's yeah. going on Got politically it. in the region or what's yeah. going on specifically within your own embassy or your own country. These That's just dinner table conversation in the diplomatic yeah. community all the Got time. It. We, are, of course, are trained to to look for very specific things. And they'll use our trade craft to, you know, to engineer uh, different scenarios. But at the end of the day, it really is about trust. Yeah. And if you can't engender trust in the person that you're targeting, then they're never going to work for you. You're not going to yeah. marry someone that you don't trust. You're not going to yeah. 
put your life in the hands of someone and they're like, eh, I'm not really sure about that guy or that girl. So building trust is important and trust is quite frankly, the, the currency of all business. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. Uh, marriage, int- you name it. It's, yeah. it's about trust. So uh, engendering and endearing yourself to that person in a way that once you, it might take uh, months or even years to really get that, um, you know, that person that you're, you're going after to the point that you can ask them. And so, them, so to speak <clears throat> on that note. Um, so taking a step back, you, so you went to these different French speaking countries, but mm-hmm. three in Africa and one in Europe. And then, and you started learning how to recruit assets right. and how to go in the beginning. Like, was it to feel <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask. Like, it, you, no, no, you know. I, I, yeah. I, 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 Eric, honestly, as if, if, I'm, if I'm being honest with myself, and I always try to be, I was a failed case officer. I did not yeah. recruit in my first tour. I did not recruit wow. in my second tour. Now, for a lot of people, that's the, that's, that's the nail in the coffin. I was going to say, our yeah, job, how do you keep going? Our, our job is to, well, because you're not just recruiting, you're handling as well. You handle existing sources. Um, you're yep. developing people, which means you might be producing intelligence that hasn't been out there before, um, but does it meet the threshold for going, moving forward to recruiting them or not? So you're constantly doing that. But I had never recruited someone saying, hey, I'm CIA. Here's what I need you to do, blah, 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 in my first two assignments. Yep. But I learned yep. more about the agency writ large and how we fit into the bigger national security puzzle and when you're when you're a kid starting off you're not thinking about what budgets look like and all the other things that go into it but i did because it was interesting to me because i needed to know the the whys of of what i was doing so while i may have failed as a recruiter in the first two the knowledge that i i gleaned from serving in west africa in near niger and then, um, and my son got sick, so my first tour got truncated, and we had to come back to the United States. You have to, the whole family has to be medically cleared in order to stay abroad. So we did two years domestically in, in Detroit. But in between leaving Niger and going to Detroit, it was like eight months, and they didn't know where to put me because I was supposed to still be serving in, in, in West Africa. So there was this little problem going on in, um, in Mogadishu, Somalia. And they put me on the desk at headquarters and that launched what became my career. I was the youngest case officer allowed to go out to to Mogadishu. And that was only because for four months straight, I bugged the shit (laughs) out of the boss and said, and bugged them and bugged them and bugged them. But I also knew every case, the history from first from first meeting to being recruited and all the things that they were doing, I knew my, I knew my material. I knew the yep. case officers behind it. I knew the reasons why we were doing this. I knew how the military fit into it. I knew the big picture because I was yep. briefing all the big military leaders who were going out to the theater. They would come by CIA headquarters for, for the CIA briefing. And I was the briefer because that's what I did for four years in the Air Force. My boss yep. turned to me one and said, hey, this is what you were trained for, and this is what you're going to do. I'm like, yeah, but I'm the youngest guy, and I'm, I'm literally the youngest guy, the most inexperienced person on the, in the entire unit. And like, that doesn't matter at CIA. Either you know <laughs> the material or you don't, and this is what you do. So they put me in that. And that gave me a lot of face time with the Pentagon. It gave me face time with the seventh floor, and the seventh floor is our C-suite where the directors, yep. uh, where the directors sit. So again, I was this GS nine, which is not that high um, no. for for my people, and I was thrust into this thing that blew up. And, and that was like, that was after Detroit. Down. That was no, that was before Detroit. That's where they that's where they put me for the eight months between leaving. Oh, got it. And that was what, Africa and then going to Detroit. I was gonna say um, that's right after Black Hawk Down happened. Correct. That's um, I was there. I, I got on the desk about six weeks before Black Hawk Down happened, which was two, three October of um, of uh, 1994. 
1993. Okay. And then I landed, I landed on the ground in January of 1994. So I spent, I spent seven weeks in Mogadishu. One of the things that I was responsible for was we had to recover the remains of our officers who had been desecrated and dragged through the streets by the Somalis, not knowing that Al-Qaeda was the ones who had trained these Somalis that eventually became Al-Shabaab. There was a whole whole bunch of history that goes in there. But ultimately, those people responsible for Black Hawk Down eventually became Al-Shabaab, which is still a problem today in yep. Kenya and East Africa. But I was on the ground in Somalia, hunting down those people responsible for, for killing our soldiers and also recovering the remains of, uh, of those so that we're not leaving them, not leaving so- them. In terms of your specific role, were you looking for people that you could bring on as agents, that you could recruit assets that would give you information on where the targets were, where the bodies were? Correct. But yeah. by the time I arrived, the decision to leave, I think the decision to leave Somalia had already been made by President yeah. Clinton. If you, if you recall, that was the time frame when Bush was handing over the, um, uh, the White House to, yeah. to Clinton's first, first administration. And he didn't have the stomach for it. And he was like, that's it. We're, we're pulling out after the Black Hawk Down incident. So I wasn't out there recruiting more people. We were handling the, the ones that were. But it was basically the mop up and the, the breaking down. Um, I was there seven of the last 12 weeks that we were in country. We pulled out on 31 March, uh-huh. uh, 1994. <laughs> and then, um, you know, after and that was you know if you so people think about CIA I I went to meetings in a helicopter I had my own <laughs> Marine Force Recon unit whose only job was to you know to protect me make sure that I I got home safely you know traveled you know, it was it was fantastic that's everything <laughs> that you think about when you're thinking of uh, a CIA movie and you know swooping down over the you know off the coast of of Mogadishu to so we don't get shot at by the insurgents. And um, it, was, it was fantastic. I loved everything about it. But what I learned was more on the geopolitical and why we meet with people that are sometimes unsavory and set the stage for my involvement in the, in the, in the hunt for those responsible for WTC 1993. Most people on the planet know where they were on 9-11. But 26 February 1993 was the first time that bin Laden tried to take down the World Trade Center. Uh, Unfortunately, six people died, um, which is six too many. But it wasn't the nearly 3,000 that he came back eight years later. I didn't actually realize people had died in that. How did six people die? I I think it was just the people in the parking structure. So the the guy who who rented the van Mm -hmm. um, didn't park it in the spot that the engineers said would, you know, uh, result in the most damage. Um, and then because these guys aren't that bright, he went back to get his deposit <laughs> for a truck that he blew up, which is how the police and the FBI wow. were able to eventually track them down. They were able to, you know, track down Ramzi Youssef. I believe there were seven, seven people who were ultimately um, identified and convicted yeah. and put in jail, including the blind shake. Now, the blind shake is really, really important because bin Laden asked for two things. Actually, asked for a lot of things, but the main two he asked for was for the U.S. presence to be out of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. He thought mm-hmm. it was an affront to Islam that, that the West would be in a country that holds the, you know, the two most um, terrible places in, in, all yeah. of their, in all of their religion. And then the second one was freeing the blind shake, Abdul Rahman. Um, and that never went away. Um, and he died in a supermax prison, I think, in, in Colorado a couple of years back. But the blind sheikh was the original OG, the original godfather. He's who Zawahiri looked up to. He's who bin Laden looked up to. He's al-Baghdadi, you name it. That was, you know, Got the it. man. And so out of the tr- Detroit office, I was able to be involved in... Um, tracking some of the Islamic charities that these guys had suborned and used as a way to 
move personnel and money and logistics around to different places. That would be like, um, you know, I don't know, the KKK using the Red Cross as a way to, you know, infiltrate different different places. Yeah. You know, a really good, this Islamic charity is really helping widows and children and building yeah. hospitals and doing good things. But all you have to do is put one person in there to bring the whole system under under yeah. under suspicion. So we spent a lot of time tracking um, terrorist financing. And yeah, so that that theme kind of continued throughout the rest of my uh, the rest of my career. But you ended up back in Africa, right? You yes after yes. Detroit. Yeah. I after Detroit went to Senegal, Senegal I went to Morocco, Morocco I went to Nigeria. And the difference okay. between the the difference between the first four, I was what we call a unilateral officer, meaning I was completely under State Department cover and couldn't reveal to anyone that I was CIA. My fifth tour in Abuja was my first assignment as a field commander. And so you're what you call nominal, meaning the Nigerian government knew that I was a CIA officer. The Nigerian uh, intelligence and security apparatus knew that I was the base chief, um, the number three in country. The, the embassy at that point was still in Lagos and I was posted in, in Abuja. So I had everything essentially from Abuja North, which was the Muslim, the Muslim part of the country, mm-hmm. Kaduna, Kano, Katsina, um, those type of places. And 9-11 happened when I was in, in Nigeria. Mm-hmm. And the Nigerians became really good partners with us. The entire world was incensed. That was a way of working uh, collaboratively and jointly with our Nigerian counterparts in in their particular country at that time. And then after Nigeria, they- Real they quick, I'm curious on the 9-11 thing, because given yes. the week, it's just you know interesting. So the well, I just watched a short part of a documentary about you know the first CIA team into Afghanistan, right after- Jawbreaker, yes. Yeah, exactly. And um, the it seemed like even Afghanistan just had felt like they had made a deal with bin Laden so they had to honor it, but they didn't agree yes. with what he had done. At so all. Did anyone in the world support Al-Qaeda and what they had done other than Al-Qaeda? Like, was, did they have allies? Uh, honest, not, not many. The, so Mullah Omar thought that bin Laden was, was too extreme. Uh, the only reason he hosted him because he was a fellow Muslim. Yep. He tried to control the people that he was bringing into these training camps, but I mean, it's almost an ungovernable space. Yeah. I've only been to Afghanistan once. I was there 9-11 of 2014. Okay. Yes, 2000 and, uh, 2014. And it's a starkly mountainous, like mountains that are, the points are so sharp, they look like razors, like they don't even yeah. look real. Like they would yeah. stab you if you fell on it. That's how sharp it is. And just an amazingly beautiful country in, uh, aesthetically. Yeah. Um, but I spent my year in the war zone on the Pakistan side of the border. I did a yeah. TEDx that kind of is, is uh, kind of not terribly well known, but uh, if you Google me, it's probably one of the first things that mm-hmm. come up. And um, the, the, the story is mostly about how I was able to convince this guy who was on our, um, I think he was a, I want to say he was a $1 million capture. A lot of these guys had, had um, rewards for justice um, yeah. prices on their head. So yeah. um, he, I think he was a million or a $2 million head. And I was wow. able to convince this guy that his way of doing things were not the right way. And we saved a lot of lives. And that was in the, you know, like the- Oh, so he was, in a, he was on the Al Qaeda uh, side. And, uh, we had a um, friend. He, he was an Al Qaeda facilitator, but he was one yeah. of the Taliban's uh, yeah. best tactical tactical uh, uh, battlefield commanders, um, specifically, and this isn't mentioned in the, in the uh, TEDx. His job was to identify and recruit at-risk youth whose families had sent them to madrasas in Afghanistan and Pakistan to study the Quran. Now, if your family had sent you to rabbinical school, if your family had sent you to be a nun or a priest, that's a very high honor for your family, and it's the same. In, yeah. in, the, um, in the Muslim world. So 
again, they suborned this established and, and recognized uh, system to feed their insurgents, to, to identify yep. these kids that they would strap vest on and say, you're doing the right thing you know, by your family and by Islam, and they'd make takes them, and they'd send these 10, 12, 14-year-old children to their deaths. Yep. I, I was away from my son, who was in his senior year of high school in Kampala, Uganda, and I said, this guy is number one on our list. And it took about six or eight months to, to catch him, but uh, eventually we did, and um, we were able to, to stop the, the, it was a, in 2006, 2007, we were getting our asses handed to us in Iraq. We were getting our asses handed to us in Pakistan, in Afghanistan. We were not faring well anywhere. And that, that year, 2006, 2007 was, was the tipping point. We were able to turn the tide that uh, eventually led to bin Laden's capture or mm -hmm. bin Laden's uh, death and the dismantling of Al Qaeda as it existed for the 20 years that I had been tracking them, 1993 to 2011 is when we finally got uh, bin Laden. So, yeah, I remember that day. And so once that happened, obviously we just pulled out of Afghanistan recently. What was, how, and when did you get out of this, the agency? When did you wait? So I, it, it will be five years uh, next month. I got okay. out in October 2018. of 2018. Yeah. And so from 2011 to 2018, post bin Laden, what, where was your focus? You had, it sounds like you spent a lot of time on that. So I like to break my career, my 28 years down into three kind of distinct uh, periods. The first, let's say the first nine years was doing the work that you learn at the farm, doing the trade craft, spotting, assessing, developing, and recruiting, recruiting uh, spies. The next third was middle management to, you know, executive ranks where I was managing stations and bases. I was twice a chief of station, I was twice a deputy chief of station, and I was twice a chief of base. So I had six field commands where I did nothing but run case officers like myself who were doing, doing these operations. You're still involved with spotting, assessing, and delivering recruiting, but mostly what you're doing is making sure that that next generation of officers has that experience and knows why they're doing it, how not to get caught, and all those other type of things. And then, of course, the last third of my career was when I got promoted to um, SIS, Senior Intelligence Service, it is the equivalent of what they call flag ranks in the military, mm -hmm. an admiral or a general. And so I got my first star in 2009 and went from Switzerland to the farm. So I spent three years um, running the farm and literally training the next generation of targeters, collection management officers, staff operations officers, and case officers who were kind of like the four core units within the clandestine, clandestine service. At that time, but not today, the, the what we call the expeditionary side of the house, our M4 and our Glock training and our medical training and some other specialized mm -hmm. training all fell up under me as well. And then the third hat that I had is every person who took the oath and and came into the agency between 2010 and 2013, fell up under, titularly up under, up under me as they were in what we call the clandestine service trainee uh, program. So when you join the agency, you spend three or four months on different desks. I spent my first three months on the North Korea desk, and then I spent three months in Africa division, and then I spent three months in um, our Office of Congressional Affairs, which was a completely different. In fact, I think I might be the only person in the history of the agency to do a, a, an interim in our congressional affairs office because I needed to see how the Hill fit into that piece. I always yeah. had my idea of what I needed, what I needed to, to, to grasp all of this. Um, so anyway, hundreds if not thousands of CIA officers who entered between 2010 and 2013 were up under my my command, and then Got it. then I went to be deputy director of the counterterrorism center. I did that for about eighteen months, maybe fifteen months, and then I was chief of Africa division, 
Now, the significance of that is when you're a case officer coming out of the farm, you'll get picked up by a geographic or an issue center, counterterrorism, counterproliferation, counterintelligence, or Latin America or, or European division or Central, you know, Central Europe, which is our Soviet, Soviet folk. Yeah. So I got picked up by Africa division. And brother, I did not want to be the black dude going to Africa. I had grown <laughs> up in Japan. I had served in Korea as an officer. East Asia division, there was no question when I walked in the door, that's where I was heading. And then I did an interim in the three months in Africa division, and I saw what they did and the breadth and depth of what they did and the reputation that they had in the building. And then there was this uh, Buana. Buana is uh, Swahili for chief. Buana is the title that you get when you're chief of Africa division. Well. Buana at that time was a guy named Bill Mosby. You know what? If you if you picture the great white hunter with the pith hat and you know standing there with the big you know the big rifle and the yeah. and the handlebar mustache, that was Bill Mosby. This dude, white cat from the sticks of Pennsylvania, knew more about Africa. There was not an African leader on the planet. They would not talk to the president of the United States, but if Buana called you you would get on the phone. I don't care if it was two o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the afternoon. If Buana called, these people took it. That was the respect that this guy had. And yeah. I was just intrigued by this guy. He knew everybody's name. He knew the wife's names, the kids' names, the pets' names. Now, Africa Division is the smallest component within the clandestine service, but it's also fights way above its pay grade. And we're known for our hard targets. We're known for our successes against the hardest of hardest people to get to. Yeah. So you learn how to be a good leader. You learn, um, you learn that compromise. You learn how to, you know, you just learn how to figure, figure things out. And so you get to 2018, you made these three different sort of tranches at the mm -hmm. agency, decide to leave. What was next? Like, what do you do after you, you spent 28 years, mm -hmm. right? Uh, 28 years, and then four in the Air Force, so 32 years um, completely. Well, one of the, so my last job was as the senior representative here in, in Los Angeles. Right. Now, that put me in touch with every aspect of the community here, Hollywood, security folks, academics, um, and of course, we're chasing you know, Iranians and Russians and other people who might be running around here doing things that they shouldn't be doing in collaboration and partnership with, with the FBI. In that job, my last three years at the agency, I met this, met this, uh, this guy at, uh, at an official event named Sandy Kleiman. Sandy is an old school CAA and um, invited me when he knew I was retiring to, to participate in this, um, in this, kind of annual conference that he and one of his business partners from New York put on where they bring tech people and all these different people in. Yep. And I had just been given approval to roll back my cover, meaning I didn't, when I retired, I could tell people that I was CIA. And um, Sandy put me on a panel at this thing and we were talking and, and one of the, one of the panel or one of the guests in the, in the audience asked, they said, well, what does a retired CIA guy do? And I said, honestly, I have no idea what I'm going to do, but I think I want to be the Shonda Rhimes of the espionage genre. Now, what I meant by that was at the time, she had four shows on the air. Now, two very significant things happened during that three, four day um, conference. Sandy came up to me and said, you know what? There's a producer friend that I've been thought, thinking about bringing into the company. Let's talk because I'm, I'm going to try and make your, you know, see if we can make your dream a reality. The other thing that happened were two women apart from each other came up and said, I never heard a guy stand on stage and say that one of his heroes are, is a woman. I said, well, most of my heroes are women, first of all. And I wasn't even really thinking of her as a woman. I was thinking of her as someone who had four shows on the air. So my, my girlfriend is a New York Times bestselling author a book called Driving the Saudis. So she's got the chops and I got the stories. So we created this, this collaboration that we call SME Creatives, Subject Matter Expert or SME. And she's the creative. She's a 
you know, an ART Harvard trained actor and voiceover actor and author and all this other kind of stuff. So she's the creative. And between the two of us, we've now created six very unique uh, espionage type shows. And we're, you know, four years into the collaboration, four years into refining, four years into getting this out. And in that process, I've been in three writer's rooms. Um, I'm learning, you know, from the ground up. I don't need, you know, money wasn't what my intent was. My intent was to learn the same way I had at the agency. I don't, okay, yeah, here's my project, but there's an ecosystem around that that I need to understand a little bit more. And until I do, I'm not gonna put myself, um, not gonna put myself out there. So I'm four years into this and we're talking to the right people and we're, I think we're starting to get a little notice and there's articles nice. about the, out there about me explaining how the CIA and how the entertainment community, are, are, they're, I'm seeing parallels all the time. It's almost spooky. And I grew up singing. I grew up on the stage. I grew up uh, acting and I grew up doing all this stuff, but I don't want to be an actor. I'm not a gifted <laughs> enough writer, but guess what? I got 32 years of some amazing, amazing stories and amazing people. And at the end of the day, I'm a creative, I'm, I'm an artist. Even when yeah. I was a case officer, there's an artistry to, to being a case officer. Um, you don't really think about it at the time. It's not like there's brush strokes and you, know, you can see or you're sculpting something. But when you're developing an asset, when you're known for your work against terrorists, your work against Iranians, your work against North Koreans, there is a kind of symbiotic flow to how that process works. And I'm using that hopefully in an effective way to, um, you know, to get some of my own material um, considered and out there, so. Yep, makes sense. Um, so last question for you. What, what would be one piece of advice you either got or wish you got that really like kept you going? Like you, you've achieved so much in the CIA, like you really stuck with it. You, you know, ranked up through the ranks. Like what would be something you'd tell someone that wants to pursue their, their dreams, whatever that might be? For the people who are coming into the CIA, there's a Latin phrase called non sibi, said Patreon, not for self, but for country. It is never about you. It is always about the American people. It is always about someone else. And as soon as you start to throw in the I or the me's into that, that's when this, that's when the whole thing starts to, starts to come apart. And, you know, we're, you're dealing with people who are type A personalities, who are the quarterbacks and the prom queens and used to being, you know, hello, here I am. When you're in the CIA, you don't want to be always noticed and seen. You want to be subtle. You want to be, if you're going to pursue a life in intelligence or you're going to pursue a life in anything that you want to do, make it about not that title or not money or not that. Just make sure that it's about the other people as well. That and some of the best advice I got before I went out to the, um, to the field for the first time. And I, I've been racking my brain trying to remember who told me this, but he said, take your job seriously, but never yourself. And, and I thought about that a lot over the years. And in the situations where I was like, but I know I'm right. I'm like, okay, it's about you. And guess what? Just take the job seriously, but not yourself. Okay. Just let the ego go. Ego is right. so anger is what gets most of us in trouble. Ego is what keeps us there. And so I'm <laughs> always battling that, that balance between, of course, I'm right. You know, of course, I know this better than anyone else. And doing that in a way that's not offensive or ma not making someone feel less than or whatever. I'm all about partnerships. I'm all about getting to whatever needs to get done. I don't believe in no. I hear no all the time. But no means, yeah. no is, means nothing. To, no is not a stop for me. No yeah. is no but. Yeah. <laughs> no and, no or. And then I would just, I would just kind of swoop them around and I'm persistent. Yeah. I, I don't, I never give up ever. Love that. Well, Daryl, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for coming on Hawk Talk. All right. I appreciate it, man. <laughs>